Blood froze from dark red to moonlight blue under the slap of Gore's bare feet. Each step took more skin off of the blackening soles and froze it to the sharp granite of the craggy trail. A week ago, he would have run in the snow, but the hard freeze made the glittering crust like thin glass. Moreover, rocks don't leave deep footprints, just bloody ones. Gore hoped that whatever was chasing him couldn't track by the smell of blood. It had only been five minutes, maybe less, since he'd last heard its massive feet plodding along behind him, and most arctic predators could scent a hare under six feet of snow. Gore ran faster. He was becoming too numb to feel the rocks beneath him. Soon he'd have to put his boots back on or he'd start losing toes. Besides, the sure-footedness of being barefoot no longer applied once you couldn't feel the ground. The last thing he could afford was to slip, break a leg, and lay helpless for that thing. He crossed into the shadows of the pine forest. The moon didn't shine through the limbs, and even the white of the snow had disappeared from his pulsing vision. Feeling his way in the dark, he bounced off of something like a tree trunk and steadied himself. The tree was devoid of bark and had jagged edges carved into it. Gore sighed with relief. He leaned against the pole and began trying to navigate his frostbitten feet back into his leather boots. He would definitely lose some toes, but it was better than losing his head. As his eyes adjusted and his strength returned, he suddenly saw the grim, scowling face of a blocky creature hovering next to his. Chills that had nothing to do with the harsh winter shivered down his arms and spine. The face resolved further, lips bright red, eyes stark white. He looked away, despite this being the very thing he'd been seeking, like it could see into him and knew who he was. This pole with the carven faces was part of a forest all its own, rimming the edge of the northern slope of the granite butte. Dozens of images, evil faces on top of comical ones, mixed with animals and spirits, were all hewn into the trunks of sacred trees and placed as a barrier between the Clinket village and the granite butte. The tribal totems were said to protect the natives against the demons of the north. Gore hoped that was true, but not too true. He huddled in the fur coat he'd found on the headless corpse and counted to 100. Nothing moved but wraith-like wisps of snow in the icy breeze. The thing had lost his trail. He lit a match and the wooden faces sprang to life. With an uneasy hand, he patted one on the cheek. You watch out for me now, Crow. You protect me, you hear? The face didn't reply. As Gore walked away, he thought, What kind of monsters do you protect against, you bastard? Hopefully not all of them. A bare spot against a frozen creek bed provided enough shelter for Gore to start a small fire without fear of being seen by the hairy thing. Tomorrow, he would go into the Clinket village and ask for safekeeping. The Clinket didn't much like the tribe. They sent something about the small cadre of white men that they didn't trust, but they were his only chance. They knew him in the village, had actually liked him once. Maybe that would mean something. Morning came with a cold wind. 
Gore hadn't slept much, but at some point he shut down his mind enough to forget about the tribe and that boy and that thing that he'd found in the cave, or rather that had found him in the cave. When he came to, the sun was just gleaming over the horizon. He'd only have an hour of daylight before it disappeared again, so he went toward the village. Snow had obscured everything so completely that he almost walked by the first lodge without realizing that it was even there. His hopes sank. There was no one inside. The village, which should have been rich with smoke and activity, was completely abandoned. Silent. He looked around, but there was only stillness punctuated by long shadows creeping into the woods. Why would they leave? The Clinket rarely moved camp once they settled in for the winter, and this was an abnormally cold year. Before organizing the tribe with McTerry, Gore had spent several weeks in this village trading the sugar and tobacco with the natives. It was where he learned how to hide his tracks by running barefoot along ridgelines, how to dress all kinds of animals for food, and most importantly, where he learned to imitate the behavior of the Clinket people, a skill he'd thought useless until he met McTerry. Then, one day, he and the Scotsman shared a bottle of whiskey in Dawson and came up with the idea for the tribe. Soon they were jumping claims together using Gore's knowledge to make it look like clinket raiding parties. Business was so good that the tribe expanded to almost a dozen men before the winter got cold and things got bad. Then that boy and his sugar came along and made it all worse. The whole thing started and ended with sugar. Even in the boom towns, a man could be hung or shot over sugar, no questions asked. And the tribe wasn't nearly that civilized. Gore found the fire pit in the center of the village. It was a small depression in the snow, far smaller than he'd ever thought useful in the Arctic cold. The clinket used surprisingly little fire, he remembered. He went past the pit to the Elder's Lodge. The lodges to either side were only sticks protruding out of the snow. The hides that had once been stretched over them had been removed too valuable to leave. The elder's lodge was still intact though, and hopefully that meant there was food inside. The flap was crusted shut so that Gore had to cut around the lashings with his knife and pull off the whole hide like it was a solid wooden door. He threw it aside and lowered his mining lantern into the dark opening. The sun was already beginning to dim. As the lantern crossed the threshold, a face appeared in the center of the lodge. Gore jumped back, thinking that the thing from the cave had somehow followed him to the village. Knife still in hand, he stumbled backwards to a crouch and prepared to defend himself. Darkness fell over the lodge door, but the face did not emerge, nor did the beast come lunging out to devour him like it had McTerry and the tribe. All was silent. Gore went back to the lodge, this time focusing the light into the shadow slowly. The form of a man resolved itself in the darkness. The man was seated in a prayer position, one he'd seen many times during his stay in the village. The man didn't move. The frosted black face had been dead for a long time. 
Gore dragged the frozen body out into the dying sun. He was shirtless, painted for battle, a lone warrior left to keep vigil. But against what? There was something familiar about the red markings on the warrior. He wasn't the elder, nor anyone that Gore could remember, but he'd seen those markings somewhere before. He cleaned off the frost from the clinket's bare chest, and a symbol appeared. It was a familial symbol, belonging to an important tribal matriarch. The symbol was drawn with a finger into a deep, blood-red stain that had been painted onto the warrior's chest. Gore suddenly remembered where he'd seen it. It was the same symbol that the boy had painted on his face. The boy with the sugar. Ten minutes later, Gore had the fire pit dug out and had built as big a fire as he could find wood for. The frozen arm of the warrior, chipped off with his hatchet, was roasting above the flame on a pile of rocks. Gore's mouth watered with the smell of cooked meat, and he smiled at the irony. Like father, like son. McTerry was probably the only other literate member of the tribe, so Gore knew that the journal must have been his, meaning that it must have been McTerry's headless body that he'd found hanging from the tree and McTerry's coat he was wearing now. His name wasn't on the journal, but that made sense. No one wanted to be associated with any record of the tribe's actions. With a full stomach, Gore began reading the words by the glow of the dying fire. He feared that the huge, hairy beast was out there somewhere, just beyond the protective ward of the totems, and the journal was the only key to what had happened at the cave the only chance he had to survive. It began. November 22. It's already under deep freeze. Oh, this winter will be a hard one. Can't return to Dawson. Most of the soldiers gotten off to fight the Spaniards. Thought this would be a good thing, but the Mounties are worse, much more savvy. They don't fall for Gordon's ruse. They say these savages wouldn't take the miners' scalps. Gordon said no one would know the difference because most of the soldiers had been Injun hunters after the civil and expected scalpins. Mounties don't fall for it, though. And now they're looking real hard at us. Can't go to Dawson, even with the season's gold just waiting in our pockets. Damn fool, Gordon. Provisions are low, but we'll hit the miners' cabins soon enough. Time to get on the war paint. Gore skipped ahead. He knew this part. About how the miners had been smart enough to leave their claims before the freeze that year, and how they took everything with them. They'd only found one old hermit braving out the winter, and he'd only had a rack of fish and very little meat on his bones. After that, two of the tribe had made a run for it and tried their luck in Dawson. From what Gore knew, one of them had made the slip on an outgoing steamer, but the other was recognized and hanged before he got his first drink. Everyone else was too scared to leave and had holed up in a cave that they used to store their booty. All pickaxes and mercury bottles, but no food. Still, they thought it would be safe to winter in that cave. Even the clinket didn't go up that mountain. December 3. Well, Gordy has redeemed himself some. Brought back an Injun boy coming from Dawson. Had a half sack of sugar. Not much, but an easy split. 
Moreover, the boy is still summer fat enough to make a decent meal. We let Gordon do his bit. Seems to bother him little enough. We call him Gore for a reason, I suppose. There was an awful amount of fat in that boy. Cave smells like grease fire, but ain't no one here praying for gourmet eats. God knows how these engines stay so fat, oh, but God bless them. They do for a fine meal in a pinch. Gore thought back to the boy and removed a leather pouch of brown crystals from his pocket. Like a Chinaman stingy on snuff, he tucked a little sugar under his tongue and let it melt away the flavor of the frost-burned warrior. He hefted the leather pouch and lamented how light it had grown. When they'd taken it from the boy, it had a full two pounds. Then he noticed for the first time that the colored thread pattern on the side made the same familial symbol as was painted on the warrior's chest. Huh, <sighs> guess I was right. He began to muse, but was suddenly distracted by a sound from the darkness of the woods. It was faint at first, but soon Gore could swear that he heard a small child moaning. It grew louder. It was a boy. The boy. The sound became a groan and a huff. Kind of a low, repeating wail, but without the wind behind it to be considered a cry. He'd heard it many times when a mine collapsed on a man's chest, or when he'd shot a blue coat in the lung during the war. This one he knew intimately. It was the sound of the boy when he'd bled him out, cut his throat. They'd saved the blood, but no one could bring themselves to drink it, so it just spoiled. Now he heard it plainly belching out of a split neck somewhere in the darkness beyond the totems. He felt the tingle of fear creeping up his spine, but pushed it down and told himself he was just shaken from cold and scurvy. The sound faded. Gore retreated to the elder's lodge with his knife and hatchet both brandished. That thing was out there. It was trying to draw him out, maybe drive him crazy. Is that how it got the tribe? He ate more sugar and tried to sleep. The totems would protect him. An hour later, he was shocked awake by another noise from the darkness. This time it came from the opposite direction, where he knew that the totem border was closest to the village. This time it was a different sound. Similar but more bestial, more savage, like cutting the throat of a bear or dying elk. It was louder. That thing may have only been 200 yards away, just pacing the border and taunting him with its devil voice. He pulled the frozen hide back into place over the lodge door, knowing that the flimsy walls would do little to keep out the cold or the demons that haunted it. The sound faded away so slowly that it was painful to hear. Then silence came, deep and sleepless. Gore lit a lantern. December 15. Engines are tramping about round the base of the butte, making a hell of a racket. Started yesterday. They was calling out a name. The boy's name, most like. Then they stopped for a while. Buff went to check it out. Came back with a scare in them. Said they was by the totems with a bigger fire than he'd ever seen them use. The old one was sitting prayer-like 
and the others was dancing. Now ain't none of that surprising. These savages get up to all kinds of hoodoo. One gets used to it. But what had Buff in a huff? <laughs> Buff in a huff. <laughs> oh, is that he says they was communicating with the dead. God knows how he got that idea. Says he'd seen him talking to the smoke and that the smoke was talking back in the voice of that boy. Said he couldn't understand that gibberish, but he swore that one of the braves looked up the butte towards our cave with a real angry look. Then they all howled. Howled like devils at the moon. Whatever that voice in the smoke told him sure put a fire in him. Coward Buff ran back lickety-split, piddling all over himself. I say the lack of food has got us all a little loopy. Maybe we'll make a foray into the village soon. Get some more grub. A fat squaw would do just right. A bestial growl rent the silence. It was the sound that the thing had made when it lunged out of the cave at Gore. This time it was accompanied by a violent knocking on dried wood that was somehow more chilling than the moan, but only just. A few seconds later, a cracking sound like old timber falling in the wind came echoing through the darkness. The thing huffed once more in violent triumph and fell silent again. Gore turned the page with panicked fingers. December 17. Oh, Gordy's done it this time. We just held counsel and found him guilty of theft. We only had one pound of sugar left. Then suddenly we only had a half. Use three of these miners' gold scales we got lying around to confirm it. Pack inspection found half a goddamn stolen pound of sugar in Gordy's stash. <laughs> Says he's innocent, that it was a frame up. Oh, doesn't matter. Rules are clear. Some of the boys say that we should go easy since Gordy helped found the tribe and says we should just kick him out of the cave. Others say that's dangerous because he could come back at any moment. Gordy says it's a fate worse than death. Frankly, I don't care, so long as there's one less mouth to feed. He's standing out of the cave and bellowing that he's innocent. <laughs> That's a good laugh. Ain't none of us innocent of anything. In other news, the Injuns are back at their hoodoo down below the rise there. I think that's part of what's got Gore too stirred up to count his blessings and leave with his life. Sounds like they got a caged bear down there growling away. Don't know what they plan on doing with it, but ten barrels of scattershot and a hungry belly says I hope they send it this way. Gore had stolen the sugar. He told himself that no one would notice, but that was just the hunger talking. Everyone knew exactly how much sugar they had left. He also remembered the growling, and it had indeed given him the shivers. When he'd finally given up pleading and left the cave, the noise had faded into the background, and he remembered breathing a sigh of relief. He never did see what was making it. He'd spent the next couple of days trying to make it back to Dawson, but when the snow came in thick, he knew he'd never make the pass. So he decided to turn around and try to make peace with the tribe. He'd eaten most of his coat, boiled it in snow melt, and swallowed it fur and all. His teeth were beginning to hurt, and he knew what came next if he didn't find fresh food. But fresh food would be a long ways off. 
When he got back to the butte, he was startled to find that the trail up to the cave was red with frozen blood. It disappeared into the woods at the bottom of the butte. Despite his curiosity, Gore waited until the sun came up and devoted its precious short hour of warmth to following the trail. It abruptly disappeared right before the line of totems. He found there a decapitated corpse spitted on the branch of a tree. He took its coat, grimy and smelling of decay. Its pockets held only a journal and the leather pouch of remaining sugar. Then he went up the butte cautiously, slowly rounding on the cave. He didn't know it at that time, but he would soon be running for his life from the thing hiding there. The low, strangled moan of a dying man came from deep in the forest. Gore startled from his reminiscence. The sound droned on, intermittently interrupted by a choking sound as if the gout of arterial blood were getting backed up in the dying man's throat. Gore froze, moving only his eyes to make sure that the knife and hatchet were still in his numb fingers. Why hadn't he taken a gun from the cave when he had the chance? The sound faded, and silence so profound that it was deafening fell over the darkness again. Gore edged forward, stiff legs protesting. From a gap in the frozen hide, he could barely just see out into the moonlight. At first, it was all just snow and the silhouettes of ancient trees, but his eyes searched around until they fell onto the corpse of the dead warrior that he'd stepped over to get to the lodge. Never step over a dead body. He heard McTerry's voice echo in his mind. Superstitious, Gore had thought, just like all his kind. But now he wasn't so sure. Hadn't the corpse been facing the other way? And what was that glint in its eyes? The moonlight? But hadn't its eyes been shut? The sound of a man bleeding out through his own cut throat ripped across the silence again. Gore could have sworn that it was coming from the corpse, but his mind was so frayed that he couldn't be sure. He pulled back into the lodge with a stifled yelp, and the sound stopped. More knocking sounds came from the woods, like someone angrily pounding on the totems out in the distance. Another crack of dried wood and a triumphant growl. What can stop it? He thought desperately. Something has to be able to stop it. He turned up the lamp and flipped the page. December 18. God damn, what a night. What a goddamn night. All night through those damn savages chanting away. That thing they got down there is growling up a storm. Buff went back down there an hour ago. Oh, he'd given him up for a goner, but he came back all a twitter again. Said that thing they got tied up down there ain't natural. Said that only one brave is left there. Some shirtless crazy fuck. Buff's gotta be delirious. Said he's the only one chanting, but there's the voices of at least a dozen men down there. Must be hiding in the woods. Of course, good chance we're all a little delirious. I'm gonna go have a look myself. I want to get a gander at this thing that Buff's all worked up over. Says it's completely hairy, like an ape from the circus, but that it stands on two legs like a man. 
I have never seen a circus, so I can't say. Said it's only a few feet tall, three or four, and it's chained to a totem. That's nuts, because Injuns don't use chains. Says it stinks, too. That I believe, because I can damn near smell it all the way up here. Like old garbage in a July latrine. The way it bellows is just... Well, let's just say it's about time to put an end to it. December 18, night. Well, I got some good news. We got full bellies. That is, if we can manage to keep it down. We ate that hairy thing. First I got La Bouffe, and we snuck down there real quiet-like. Got within seeing range of that crazy engine. And boy, do I mean crazy. You ain't got no idea. Feller had that big old fire going, and sure enough, that thing was chained up down there, going a mile a minute, like it was rabid or something, just like Buff says. I don't know how he saw us. We were real sneaky. Damn sure we hadn't made a noise. We've gotten good at sneaking in the tribe. We knows what we're doing. But some way that brave knew just where to find us. He stopped his chanting, all dozen voices of it, and looked up right at Le Buff and me hiding in the crags. I hefted my rifle to put an end to it, but before I could fire, that damned engine pulled up a bowie and clean cut his own damned throat with a deep, slow cut. Oh my god, that ting on the chain went berserk. Like it knew what was coming next. You see, that brave looked away from us right before he did it. Looked right at that monkey ting and they both got real quiet. The ting got all still like it was afraid. Then the brave nodded to it like they understood each other. Well, the next thing we know, gouts of blood are all gushing under the snow. The brave fell down, shaking like he had the palsy, and the thing went to screaming and jerking at its chains with the power of ten men. Damned lucky it was chained and not just tethered. So, the next thing I know, I hear a loud crack next to me, and Le Buff had put a fifty ball right in that thing's head. Damned fine shot when he needs to be. So we go down the hill and Le Buff is all talking about how he's gonna eat the monkey thing. Like he didn't even see the blamed crazy engine just bleed himself out like that. To be honest, my mouth would have been watering too if it hadn't been for the stench. Oh my god, the stench. It's all about the cave now. But I guess it's better to be stinking than starving. Next, we start dressing the ting, mostly to get its head free from the chain, and the fire starts to burn down. But it's not quite out yet when that engine elder overguesses his cunning, and I see him moving between a couple of trees in the shadows. I turn and fire, oh, but go wide, and Le Buff gets up his gun. He pulls and it clicks on an empty chamber. Damned fool was so excited for meat that he didn't reload. Anyway, I look back and that crazy brave is gone. His body had clearly been dragged by some other engine into the woods. I thought about going after them right then, but knew they'd have sport of us if we went into the woods. I'm not worried about the cave. We got half ton of mining charges and more pistols and rifles than we could shoot in a week. They know they're no good coming up our way, which is why I figure they'd try and draw us into the pine. Anyway, Le Buff and I get the meat back here and the boys damn near kiss us despite the smell. It was greasy, and I swear to God that the stink is coming out of our pores. But like I say when the boys complain, ain't none of us gourmet.
Gore looked out of the gap in the lodge again. He hadn't noticed before, but it did indeed look like that corpse had its throat cut. The red of the blood glistened as though it were still wet. A black shadow dashed across the scene between Gore and the corpse. A strong smell of decay and garbage struck him through the gap like a bad wind. The smell was familiar. It was the smell of the thing that had been chasing him the previous night. It was also the smell that was so strong in the cave and on his new coat. What was it the journal had said? That stink is coming out of our pores. Gore sniffed the coat and winced. The shadow darted by again. This time, the sound of the clinket boy bleeding out came loudly from just behind the lodge. Only the thin layer of hide and frost to separate them. It was deafening. Gore huddled in the middle of the flimsy structure, scared. He'd not known fear for a long time. Not when he was in the war... Not when he'd come north with nothing but a pistol and whatever gear he could rustle from the rushers. Not when the Mounties came after him for scalping miners. But now, he was scared. He looked down at the journal. There were only blank pages left. What had happened at the cave? It couldn't have been that small beast they'd eaten. They said it had only been three or four feet tall. The one in the darkness was huge. Maybe an older one. A parent? An angry parent looking for its child? Shit! The smell came back as the lodge jolted struck by a very large fist. I'm not worried about the cave, the journal had said. They know they're no good coming up our way. But maybe something else would have better luck, Gore thought. Then the brave nodded to it like they understood each other. Not a lone warrior standing vigil, Gore realized of the corpse. But a sacrifice. A bargain. A life for a life. And now the thing knows how to find the ones it sought. The only language that makes sense to demon beasts. The scent. The scent of sin. On the hunt. Revenge. He raised his hatchet defensively toward the door, impotent fear coursing through him. The lodge shook again. Frost fell around Gore like a dusting of snow. The sound of a child dying echoed through the darkness again. But not a human child this time. A bestial one, pierced through the skull by a lead ball. Then a long, slow moan of mourning that ended in a violent, angry howl. An anger so determined that it overcame nine armed men, so keen that it destroyed the guardian totems, so final that it cost the people of the village whatever uneasy peace they held with the demons of the north. It howled again, and the sound of the frozen warrior's corpse shattered by its great strength tinkled like broken glass through the walls. Gore shook. The tent shook. 
And then the world exploded into a moonlight snowscape as the hide walls were rent apart. Gore scream. 